Good morning, friends. Welcome back to Mechanical Behavior of Materials, Part Two. So today we are on lecture number twenty-six, and I will be teaching another topic uh, in this part of the course, and the topic is creep. So you have already been exposed to the other failure mechanisms, fracture and fatigue, and that too for metals as well as ceramics and polymers. Now we will look at the mechanism of or the phenomena of creep so let's begin so we will begin with fundamentals of the creep phenomena i have also taught if you most of you would remember me from mechanical behavior of materials part 1 where i taught many of the contents in that particular course so what is uh, the beginning let's begin with what is uh, creep and even more fundamental is where exactly is creep important so when and where creep does occur and the answer is when a component is subjected to high stresses as well as high temperatures it is then that creep comes into picture or creep becomes important what are those kind of applications so some of the applications are shown over here they are power plants Uh, for example steam turbine gas turbine or in aerospace engines which are working at very very high temperature and uh, the stresses are also very high in these engines then oil refineries which are also again working at very high pressure and high temperature chemical plants all these are places where we where the components experience or are exposed to very high temperatures and at the same time are also exposed to very high stresses sometimes even if the stresses are not high but temperatures are high uh, so even at relatively low stresses a component can ex can experience creep so what we see is that high temperature is the critical parameter so what exactly does high temperature do that something uh, some kind of deterioration takes place in the material which eventually leads to its failure so we know that whenever you have a high temperature atoms start to move faster and therefore all the diffusion controlled phenomena becomes faster and mass transfer becomes faster so something like uh, oxidation or plastic deformation all of these will become faster and since plastic deformation becomes faster so of course the material failure can occur faster at higher temperature at higher temperature we also have very large amount of vacancies and therefore they also play a role in the overall transformation of the material microstructural degradation of the material as we will see it is related to some of the phenomena that uh, some of the mechanisms that we'll see for the creep uh, where vacancies play a role then dislocations now dislocations are also some uh, thermally activated entities and some of their uh, movement we know like the climb is thermally activated so those will also become will get activated and therefore the plastic deformation which happens due to the climb motion of the dislocation would become faster on the other hand because we have higher temperature so we know that annihilation takes place for the dislocation and therefore decrease their dislocation density may decrease so it kind of looks like there would be a competing phenomena and we will see how it would affect the overall microstructural behavior of the material then other than dislocations even at the grain level we know that uh, some phenomena can be affected because of the elevated temperature one of these very important phenomena is grain boundary sliding so as you would again see that this leads to the creep the or aids in the mechanism of this creep then there is grain boundary migration meaning you can have grain growth taking place because the grain boundaries are moving and in some cases this may also mean uh, degradation of the material then at higher temperature you also have recrystallization taking place and if it is a work hardened material it would mean that the strength would go down and anyways the strength goes down at higher temperature so this is again a uh, degradation in the mechanical properties of the material so 
many of these things we can see clearly see are directly related to high temperature phenomena simultaneously some transformation we know phase transformations can also take place at high temperature so phase transformation precipitation oxidation all these can also be accelerated at higher temperature because these are kinetics governed phenomena so kinetics becomes faster at higher temperature and therefore these processes would become faster and therefore we are bound to see some microstructural changes most of which would be uh, de uh, deter which will lead to deterioration in the properties of the material and this is what the uh, leads to the failure of the material and uh, you would see that these are all related to the creep phenomena and this also tells us that if you want to utilize a material at high temperature we need to develop materials with improved high temperature strength because this is one of the key properties which is going down with increase in temperature and another thing that is taking place is that oxidation uh, so we if we want to use a material at high temperature then it should also have very good oxidation resistance okay so now coming to creep now we have looked at the most important uh, parameter temperature and what it does to the microstructure so now let's get to the formal definition of creep what is creep creep is time dependent plastic deformation at constant load or constant stress which is usually significant only at high temperatures so like we said at high temperature the deformation plastic deformation gets accelerated or even as you would see where you would not have expected plastic deformation for example below yield strength you would see plastic deformation and that leads to the failure of the material now this can happen at either constant load or at constant stress and this is usually significant only at high temperatures even at low temperatures theoretically you would have some creep but the rate would be so low that it will not make any significant changes but plastic deformation we already know is can occur in a material so what is uh, new is it only that it will become faster no that is not the only thing the other important thing is that it can also happen below the tensile yield stress so usually uh, so far at room temperature phenomena what we have studied about mechanical behavior we have taken yield strength to be like sacrosanct characteristics so nothing should happen or the material should not plastically deform before uh, before we reach the yield strength of the material except in fatigue strength as you would remember so except in fatigue we have normally treated yield strength as the sacrosanct stress value below which the material should not degrade or deteriorate but creep can happen when the temperature is high but what do we mean by high temperature is 1000 degree high is uh, 5000 degree high or even 1 degree 100 degree celsius high and the answer lies in, in the definition of uh, in how we define the high temperature so for that we need homologous temperature what is homologous temperature the temperature you are testing or the temperature at which the material is present divided by the melting temperature and both these temperatures are being taken in kelvin because all the other scales would be relative so this is being taken in kelvin so testing temperature by melting temperature when it is greater than 0.3 then we say that it is high so it is material dependent and it is particular in particular it is dependent on the melting point of the material for example think about lead and tungsten for uh, these two are like materials on the two extreme end lead has very low melting point tungsten has very high melting point so since the hollow melting point for lead is low so this denominator becomes smaller and therefore even 25 degree celsius divided by the melting point of lead which is close to 300 degree celsius and when you put it in kelvin is greater than 0.3 and therefore even room temperature is high meaning creep can take place in lead at even at room temperature on the other hand tungsten is 3500 plus melting point so the denominator becomes very large in kelvin you add plus 273 and now even a temperature like 500 1000 degree celsius 
uh, not 1000, 1000 would probably exceed, but even 500 degrees Celsius divided by the melting temperature in Kelvin would be lesser than 0.3 and therefore it is not high for tungsten. So it, you can clearly see it depends on the melting point of the material or in other words on the material. What is what when we say what high temperature. When we are talking about creep, then grain boundaries also have a very important role to play. And in this regard, we have another term, which is equicohesive temperature, a temperature at which grain boundary and grain have same strength. And again, when we are talking about temperature, this has, it is best, best if we represent in terms of homologous temperature and therefore it is approximately 0.5 TM. So melt, uh, put that melting temperature in Kelvin and 0.5 of that is usually the equi-cohesive temperature. Now, what do we mean by that? So for example, at low temperatures, we know that grain boundaries act as a barrier, meaning they have much higher strength, relatively higher strength than the grains. And because of this, they block the dislocation motion and lead to the strain hardening of the material. And that is why we also at low temperature or room temperature, again, I would not, I should not use that room temperature word, I should use low temperature because it will be material dependent. So at low temperature, we want fine grained materials because finer the material, the more the grain boundaries, more will be the resistance to dislocation motion. So relative strength of, so if we are talking about low temperature, relative strength of grain boundaries are higher. Now, as we go higher towards the higher temperature, what happens is that grain boundary strength becomes much lower. Now it is not able to block the dislocation. In fact, whatever resistance the dislocation phase is inside the grain, although it is also diminished. So relatively speaking, now grains have higher strength or higher resistance to dislocation motion. And again, let me emphasize, this is relative strength. So absolute in, in terms of absolute strength, of course, this is also decreasing, but relatively speaking, now grains are posing higher resistance to dislocation motion than the grain boundary. So there must be a temperature where they cross and whether the temperature where they cross is called the equicohesive temperature. Now, when you are testing a material at temperature lower than equicohesive temperature, and if it fails by fracture, it will have usually transgranular fracture because grains are the weaker region. So grains would, fracture would occur along inside the grains. And if it is happening at a temperature which is higher than the equicohesive temperature, now here grain boundaries are relatively weaker. So the fracture would occur along the grain boundaries, which will be intergranular fracture. At high temperature, so we have seen that at low temperature, grain boundaries act as a uh, barrier and at high temperature, grain boundaries gets weaker than the bulk, grain boundary sliding can take place, grain boundaries act as sources and sinks for vacancies and all these are signs that grain boundaries are relatively weaker. And therefore at higher temperature, what we are looking for are coarser grains because more and more deterioration or failure phenomena can occur along the grain boundaries. Therefore, if you want the overall strength to be higher, then you want coarser grains. And that is why if you remember that for the turbine blades, we use single crystal nickel super alloys. Why? Because there will be no grain boundaries and therefore no phenomena like grain boundary sliding, grain boundary migration can take place and also the creep phenomena which is all related to these activities will also not take place. And therefore, single crystal grains are considered best for the turbine blades. Now here is a schematic to explain what is or how the creep takes place. Let's say this, this is a rod, assume as a cylindrical rod, which has a length L naught and it is hanging on one side. So let's say we put a weight and when we put a weight then there will be of course some extension and which will be inelastic in nature because we have put the weight such that the yield point is not exceeded. So we are still under below the yield point. 
So at the moment where you put the weight, there will be extension, which will be elastic in nature. And if you remove this, then it will go back. And which clearly shows that this is elastic in nature. So let's say this is the time t equal to zero. And if it is happening at relatively high temperature, and when we say relatively high temperature, meaning homologous temperature is greater than 0.3, then with time, what will happen is that with this load itself, and as the time increases, the length of the rod keeps increasing. So here it is like this, here it is this. Now, after even some more time, it becomes this. After some more time, it becomes even this. And you can see as the rod is elongating, the cross-sectional area is also decreasing. And eventually we have the failure because rod becomes so thin that somewhere the voids and coalescence, the void coalescence will take place and the material will fail. And this slide has been made courtesy Professor Gautama. So this very neatly explains this phenomena of creep. So the overall out from the outside, what is happening is clear to us from here. But inside what is happening is what we are going to understand through this lecture. Now, the question here is, when we put the load here and with the load, the extension is taking place. So is it a constant load condition or is it a constant stress condition? So you need to think about it. It's not very difficult question. Or is it that both of them are uh, present here? Meaning it is also a constant load or, and as, as well as a constant stress. And uh, even the other uh, option is that it is neither constant load nor constant stress. So think about it and uh, we will be answering this question probably towards the end of this brief lecture. You would be you know, yourself be able to answer this. Now, like uh, any testing process, you need to have some standard so that you can define what should be the shape of the sample, what should be the dimension of the sample, and uh, what is the range of temperature, and uh, how to calibrate the thermocouple, how to put the thermocouples, and how to measure the important parameter, for example, time for rupture and the strain rate and all this. So, like all other mechanical testing, there is also a ASTM standard for this and uh, ASTM is for American standard, which is widely used and equivalent to this, we also would have other standards in Europe and Japan and elsewhere, but more or less they would not change much. And they establish a way for us to compare different materials or a material with different microstructure and with different properties or with uh, material with different uh, compositions. Here is a schematic of the equipment which is used. So there is a furnace and here you will have a sample like this. So somewhere you will again have sample being held on the two side like in a tensile test. But here you will be applying some load on the sample and this whole setup would be inside a furnace. So this furnace would ensure that you would have a constant temperature in the gauge lamp. And uh, usually the furnace are in three or four zones. So this is the middle zone where the temperature would remain. It is expected to remain constant and therefore the overall gauge length would be at a one con constant temperature. And the grips here are usually made of high strength, uh, high temperature material like inconel alloys so that they can withstand whatever is high temperature they are exposed to. And because they will be used again and again and again. And it is shown over here. So here is your sample. And usually such samples are held like this with the help of the pin. Because if you use the simple grip method that is used in tensile test, then at high temperature it may slip out and your results would get erroneous. And this is the equipment which is there at IIT Kanpur. So here is the frame. So this is the furnace uh, that you see over here. And uh, here is the temperature controller. And if you go from this side to this side, back side, you would see this is a cantilever kind of uh, configuration 
and the load is put over here. So weight is over here. So this particular creep system is for constant load because we have kept the load and we are not measuring the stress um, and changing the load. This load remains safe. So even though the sample becomes thinner, in which case the stress would be, load will be weight by area, which would become larger and larger as the cross-section decreases, but then we are not changing the amount of load. And therefore this is a constant load configuration and not a constant stress condition. But remember both of these can be used for creep testing. So the creep test measures the dimensional changes which occur when subjected to high temperature at constant load or stress. So the important thing is that it measures strain for the, from the measured extension. So the sample is becoming larger and from that it is measuring strain and with respect to time. So that is, the, that is what we uh, plot when we are doing the creep test, strain versus time. And this is another uh, schematic of how this is kept. So this is a cantilever, this is a weight, and as the sample extends, the weight comes lower and lower. And you can put a sensor over here, you can put a sensor over here to measure how much the extension has taken place. And with respect to the original length, you would be able to measure the strain value. So like I said that uh, in this method or, or in this test, what you plot is strain on, uh, versus time. So on the y-axis we have strain and on the x-axis you have time. And I also said that uh, usually, in fact, for any meaningful creep, you would have the stress below the tensile stress and therefore what you will get is a elastic strain over here. So there is an instantaneous. So you see when time is equal to zero, at that time itself, you see some amount of strain. And what is that? That is the strain that is because of the elastic strain. And we also see, we saw in the schematic that as soon as you put the load, you saw, see some strain. And that is what is represented over here. And then as the time goes by, the curve follows something like this. So the initially the strain rate is very high, then it comes down then it becomes constant for a very long region and then again it becomes very large towards the end and eventually fails. Now here you can clearly see that there are three stages. One stage where it is constantly changing, increasing uh, from very high to a constant rate. So this is called stage one or primary creep, transient creep stage where the creep rate is continuously decreasing. Then we have a second stage which is secondary creep where the creep rate remains constant d epsilon by dt is equal to constant and then eventually we have the tertiary creep where again the creep rate increases and eventually failure of the material occurs of the sample failure of the sample occurs so if we look at the creep rate which is the strain rate then you would see that it starts from high comes down to lowest val lower value and it remains constant throughout the second stage. And then again, in the third stage, it increases. And somewhere over here, it will fail. So it is the second stage or which has the lowest creep rate, but also this is the one which is of prime importance when we are designing the component for any application. Because this uh, one that it, this is the longest region. So in terms of time, so here the total amount of time remains very high. So this is very long time. And so all your components are designed to exist in this time domain when they are being used for application during, even though some creep may be taking place. And thankfully in this stage, the creep rate is the smallest. So what you plan is that the, with this, this creep rate, the overall functionality, overall dimensionality of the component is not lost. So those are the things that you have to take, keep in mind. Now, another point that you would note here is that there are two curves drawn. One is marked as A, the other is marked as B. A is going up and B is going down. So what is the difference? And the difference is actually that A curve is for constant load 
meaning you have kept the load and you are you don't worry about how much is the stress stress would keep increasing actually so eventually it fails like this so up to this point both of them are constant curve b is when you have constant stress so what it says is that stage 1 and stage 2 a and b are same only in stage 3 or the tertiary creep they differ, get differentiated so where the where you put constant stress it kind of follows the secondary stage in terms of strain rate and may probably last a little longer but then failure has internally failure has begun in the sample and therefore it will it is of no more use so you have you can use the material only up to this point so the important things here are instantaneous instantaneous strain that there are three stages primary secondary and tertiary which are also uh, named as one stage one stage two and stage three and that stage two has the lowest creep rate so a little bit more about the stages of creep so we see that initially the creep rate is high and then it decreases so what is happening what kind of so there some kind of competition must be taking place which is changing the value and it is indeed true there is work hardening as well as recovery taking place because the temperature is high so some amount of recovery is taking place and because you have applied some load therefore work hardening is taking place so both of these things are taking place simultaneously and therefore there is a competition between these two that governs the initial transient stage and eventually the creep rate which is very high it comes down with increase in time the recovery rate becomes higher recovery rate becomes higher and eventually becomes uh, comparable to the work hardening rate and therefore the strain rate becomes constant in the secondary stage work hardening rate is equal to the recovery rate but we must keep in mind that this is a non conservative motion meaning the overall density of vacancies is not maintained overall sites are not maintained and it is because of this that eventually the material is uh, will fail because microstructurally things are changing it's not it's dyna uh, dynamic it is not constant and therefore the overall microstructure will change and eventually the material will fail then the third stage or the is the tertiary creep where some amount of damage is getting accumulated so voids are forming at some places eventually they are coalescing and eventually the there may be cracks voids or other types of failures which uh, other type of damages which may accumulate and failure may eventually take place in this tertiary stage the secondary stage is also called a steady state creep rate three rate because we saw that the creep rate is constant over here and uh, it is the longest duration so this is the most important from the design perspective now when we are talking about uh, creep test there is also another test that you should be aware of and it is called stress rupture test and it also it is also done in similar fashion as creep test but there are some subtle differences that we will see in this slide when we are doing the stress rupture test the, uh, what we are looking at is rupture life or the total time to fracture and this is particularly important when we are looking for very high loads and high temperatures for very short life durations so overall creep is a time dependent plastic deformation at constant load which is usually significant at high temperatures and the important things that we measure here are dimensional changes in the component so that whether we can see whether this will come material will dimensionally and uh, structurally be remain suitable for the whole duration and in that respect creep rate is an important factor on the other hand stress rupture test is carried in similar way but up to the failure what it is measuring is the effect of temperature on long time load bearing characteristics and therefore with that uh, in mind rupture life or the time to fracture is important parameter and this table further describes the difference between the two so creep test is carried out may be carried out till failure you need not may, many a times as soon as you know that you are in the tertiary stage uh, you may stop the experiment because 
what we were interested is the secondary creep rate or the steady state creep rate. But stress rupture test has to be always carried out till the failure. Load in creep test, the load is not very high. It is the temperature which remains high and uh, because of which creep is taking place. So you are looking at those under those conditions, how long the material will remain safe for the application. And the stress rupture test load is very high and you know that the material is to fail. You only want to know the total time it will take to fail or, and the total uh, strain that will co be caused during that failure. As expected, because the load is high, uh, sorry, load is low in creep test, so the creep rates are low. In here, loads are very high, so creep rates are high. Again, loads are low, so the test period is also much longer, 2000 hours to 10,000 hours. While stress rupture usually will not cross 1000 hours. Total strain will also remain very small in the creep test, 0.5% of the order of 0.5%. And in stress structure, again, this would this quantity would also be very high of the order of 50%. So they are similar, the stress rupture test and uh, creep test. One is carried for application which where the loads are low and would be used for a very long time. The other is for testing the failure of the material under high load and high temperature conditions. And therefore, the important parameter becomes rupture life. And for this one, the important parameter becomes creep rate. So the two important parameters which are used for design considerations for high temperature application are steady state creep rate. So steady state creep rate is used when the second stage constitutes a significant fraction of the total creep strain. And if a material is designed for hundreds or thousands of power, for example, jet engine turbine blade, or for many years, for example, boiler tubing. So a steady state creep rate becomes important and therefore creep type of testing is more meaningful for, these, for finding out this parameter. The other parameter which is used for design consideration is the rupture time. If the material is designed for short duration, for example, one shot rocket engine component. So you are applying very high temperature and very high stress, and you want to see how much load it can take, how much time it will take to fracture. So the fracture or the rupture time becomes more important. And therefore, the rupture test kind of test would be what you would be interested in this. So these are the two important parameters uh, for creep like that is obtained from creep like tests creep test and stress rupture test, which are used in design consideration of the component. Now let's look at, uh, we know that temperature and stress has a, uh, is what is causing the creep, but how does that creep curve changes when you change the stress or when you change the temperature? And it so happens that whether you're increasing temperature or whether you're using stress, they have similar type of, not same, but similar type of effect on the creep plot. So again, I have shown you the plot, which is creep strain on the y-axis and on the x-axis you have time. And the first plot is when the temperature is below homologous temperature of 0.3 TM. Therefore, it means that ideally no creep would take place and this is what is shown schematically. So there is a transient stage, but then after that creep rate is almost zero. So this becomes, there is no significant change in the dimension after this. This is, let's say we are first looking into the consideration of temperature. So this was very low temperature. Now we have increased the temperature to T1, to T2, to T3. So T3 is highest, T2 is a little lower, T1 is still lower, and this one was very low, less than 0.3. So what is happening to the creep curve. What we see is that this is the curve for T1, this is the curve for T2, this is the curve for T3. And these lines are demarcating stage one, stage two, and stage three. So what we see is that stage one will occur at a much smaller time, as you would expect with increasing temperature. Similarly, stage two to stage three transformation would also occur at a much lower time. 
as you keep increasing the temperature. What's more is that strain rate, as you can see, which is the slope here, strain rate, which is strain rate one, strain rate two, strain rate three, keeps on increasing with increasing temperature. So here it is, this is the slope, this theta is small, this theta is larger, this theta is even larger. So creep rate has increased as we keep increasing the temperature. And uh, still another parameter that changes is the rupture time. So the rupture time, okay, so there is a, it is a little erroneous here. This should read as TR1. This should be TR2 and this is TR3. So let me just, okay, so we were looking at this slide and here I have changed uh, one, two, and three. So you can see the rupture time for the lowest temperature is largest. As you increase the temperature two, the rupture time has decreased and for three, it is even lower. Now that is the effect of temperature. We can also have the effect of stress. So now ignore the T part and assume that we are increasing the stress. So sigma one, sigma two is higher than sigma one and sigma three is higher than uh, all the sigma two and which is greater than sigma one like this. So this now, so earlier when we were increasing the temperature, we assumed that sigma is constant. Now when we are increasing the stress, we will assume that temperature is constant because if you change both the variables, then there will be complex outcome, which we can only describe with the help of equations. So we'll come to the equations, but, but this is only a schematic understanding. And for a schematic understanding, we will assume temperature is constant. And here also we see similar type of effect. When sigma is increased, the strain rate is increasing. So strain rate one and strain rate two is greater than strain rate one, strain rate three is greater than strain rate two. So as the sigma is increasing, strain rate has increased. Similarly, the transformation from stage one to stage two has decreased or has happened faster as you increase the stress. And so has the transformation from stage two to stage three. And the rupture time has also decreased as you increase the temperature. So with increasing stress or temperature, the instantaneous strain increases. Yeah, this is another important aspect that I missed. So this is the instantaneous strain. And as you can see that as you increase the temperature or the stress, and again, the instantaneous strain increases. The steady state creep rate increases, which we have shown here, the time to rupture decreases. In fact, all these zones decrease with increasing temperature or stress. So that is the effect of temperature and stress on creep curves. Now, if we look at uh, phenomenologically, what is happening? So there are two phenomena taking place, work hardening, which can be given by the equation H equal to D sigma by del sigma by del epsilon and recovery, which is uh, due to high temperature R equal to minus del sigma by del T. So this is minus because this is uh, decreasing the, or uh, this is leading to decrease in the strain rate. And uh, this is increasing the strain rate, sorry, um, uh, let me recorrect myself. So, Work hardening is del sigma by del epsilon. So when more and more work hardening means more and more strain and more and more recovering means less and less uh, strain. And uh, if we look at the strain rate phenomena, then it can be related to R and H. So it will become R by H, which will be like this. And for the steady state condition, this will become a constant. So overall this, term would come out to be a constant where rate of recovery is fast enough to equal to the rate of re, uh, strain hardening so that a balance is reached, reached between them. And once a balance is reached between these two, well, then we get secondary stage, which is the steady state strain rate condition. Now we have looked at the overall phenomena. Now let's look at or try to get understanding of the mechanism, creep mechanism. But uh, we will be looking only with the, uh, respect to the crystalline materials. Okay, so creep will also take place in non-crystalline materials, but that is uh, currently beyond the scope of this lecture. We will concentrate on the creep mechanism of crystalline materials.
Stress and temperature are two important variables that we have realized in last few slides, which not only affect the creep rate, but also the mechanism operative. The two kinds, there are primarily two kinds of mechanism. And what are these two? These, these are dislocation controlled mechanism and diffusion controlled mechanism. These and their subclasses are shown in the next slide. So when a creep is taking place, it can be because of either individual of these or a combination of these mechanisms that which are listed in the next slide. Depending on the stress and temperature, other mechanisms of plastic deformation or microstructural changes may also occur concurrently with creep. So it is not only creep that may be taking place, depending on the stress and temperature, maybe plastic deformation is also taking place. So for example, slip and dynamic recrystallization may also be taking place. And since stress and temperature are the two important parameters which define which particular mechanism is controlling the creep, where therefore a deformation mechanism map has been developed, which is drawn uh, with respect to temperature and stress as the axis. And in here, you can see which, part, in which region, which particular mechanism is dominating. And in order to make it uh, uniform or more ap applicable across the material, what we use is homologous temperature and normalized shear stresses. So that way we are able to get a more, uh, you can say, universal map as we would see in uh, later slides. So here is the listing of the mechanism. So the creep can be classified either on phenomenology, meaning what you are observing. So Harper don creep phenomena where it is independent of uh, grain size and power law creep, which is proportional or which is uh, directly related to the stress that we are applying. And uh, this is related to the dislocation creep. Mechanism wise, like you said, we can have dislocation related. So cross slip, climb, glide, these are the dislocation motion which can get uh, affected because of temperature. Ideally, glide is not uh, temperature governed, but because there is vacancy also involved, therefore these phenomena can get influenced because, uh, because of the increased temperature. Climb is the phenomena which is directly activated by high temperature and therefore this kind of uh, dislocation climb is directly related to high temperature and leads to the creep phenomena. The other major, so one is dislocation related creep phenomena, the other is diffusional related creep phenomena. So the diffusion may be taking place along the grain boundary, in which case it is called cobalt creep. Uh, dislocation may be, uh, sorry, the diffusion may be taking place primarily through the lattice, in which case it is it will be called nebaro herring creep, or the dislocation may be taking place through the dislocation core in the diffusional creep. So there is no uh, specific name, but it is it usually occurs in combination with these two, depending on the dislocation density of the material. And then there is a still another class, which is not its in itself a separate class, but which mostly you can say is a aid to these two mechanisms. And it is grain boundary sliding. We'll see, we'll take a look at these. And uh, this slide is courtesy of Professor Anand Subramanian. So if we look at the overall factors that affect the creep rate or the strain rate, these are put on the right side and on the left side, we have the overall creep rate. So these are kind of normalized, so sigma with respect to the shear modulus, Berger, uh, the, disl the grain size D has been normalized with respect to the Berger vector. And D is here the diffusion coefficient, which will determine which is based on which particular phenomena is dominant, whether it is the lattice, diffusion or whether it is the grain boundary diffusion or the dislocation core structure. And G is again the shear modulus, B is the uh, Berger vector and T is the temperature and K is the Boltzmann constant. So D itself is, if you remember, would be a temperature dependent parameter, which will have 
which is where actually the activation energy or the uh, mode of diffusion is taken into account so if it is whether it is lattice diffusion or grain boundary diffusion etc it will change the value of this q so based on the phenomena you can calculate the activation energy qc and then compare whether it is closer to the lattice diffusion or whether it is closer to the grain boundary diffusion or whether it is closer to the uh, dislocation pore diffusion and what is more interesting is that since we have this empirical relation it can then be uh, summarized or simplified to various other models as you will see later on so here is the generalized mukherjee bird dawn equation where d is equal to d itself a thermally activated process now if you have a constant grain size or probably your phenomena is independent of the grain size then the overall strain rate can be written like this so all the values uh, of the b by d can now be summed up in this pair in this constant a so a is a constant so this can be brought together in a here which will become a prime actually and this then there is this pair this parameter which is diffusion and temperature dependent and there this one which is stress dependent and if we are keeping the temperature constant then this whole thing will also become a constant and therefore this can be clubbed together to become b prime and this one and even the g can be is a constant so can be taken out and therefore this will become b prime sigma to the power n which is called power law creep so now if you take log on both side we would get a slope for the straight line we will get a straight line uh, with increasing stress and the slope of this would be equal to n so it clearly shows that this equation is valid however if you you may also encounter in some cases that your uh, with a change in the stress you are getting two different lines and what it implies is that there are actually two different mechanisms so up to this stress one mechanism is taking place and up to this stress beyond this stress another mechanism is taking place and uh, usually for higher stresses the slope is of the order of 3 to 8 and for low stresses n is or the slope or the n is close to the one value and remember this uh, signifies change in the mechanism now uh, coming to a little bit of quantification so we saw that if you have this relation and at constant stress it becomes something like this so here you have ad not gv by kt so here temperature is our variable and uh, everything else if you look at it is a constant so we can curve it together into b by t so the strain rate becomes like this now from here if you have the value of strain rate at two different temperature then actually you can calculate the activation energy for the creep phenomena so let's say you were able to calculate strain rate to 1 and 2 at two different different temperatures t1 and t2 so you can clear easily show that from here you can get to this relation so q can be calculated from this relation but again keep in mind that if we are assuming that the mechanism does not change if the mechanism changes then for the separate sections you will have to calculate separate q values and in fact it has been found that the qc values give a very good indication of which mechanism is dominating so for example at ele elevated temperature where the stresses are not very high people have calculated the creep activation energy and plotted against the activation energy of the lattice diffusion qd so qc is plotted against qt and when you plot it all the most of the elements fall on the line qc equal to qd which clearly shows that the creep uh, phenomena the activation energy is that governed by the diffusion lattice diffusion so this is at elevated temperature and low stresses but if you are doing it at lower temperature relatively lower temperature and where the lattice diffusion is not dominating where other type of diffusion for example the grain boundary diffusion is dominating or maybe the dislocation 
core diffusion is dominating, then you would see that the QC by QD value can fall down. So at higher temperature, you can see, so again, when we say higher temperature, we have plotted it with respect to homologous temperature. So at higher temperature, QC by QD value is close to one, but as you go to lower values of Q, uh, temperature, then QC by QD value can go to lower values, like even 0.5 QD, which means that some other uh, diffusion mechanism is dominating. Maybe it is the grain boundary diffusion mechanism or the dislocation core structure diffusion. But clearly, there is a different diffusion mechanism that is uh, governing the overall behavior. So this is a very nice uh, way to calculate the activation energy from the for two different temperature condition. And then you can compare to understand what mechanism is dominating. And since these have uh, got good correlation, it means that the overall equation is also very effective. So overall, we have diffusional creep where only diffusion and no dislocation is actually contributing. Then we have dislocation creep and no matter what you want to do, but when you have dislocation that some kind of dis, uh, diffusion has to take place. So for example, diffusion of vacancies, if it is a climb process and uh, if it is glide controlled, then only you can say, okay, it is completely dislocation controlled phenomena. But over there also the kinetics will get changed or disturbed because of the increased temperature. And then apart from this, like we saw earlier, there is grain boundary sliding, which is a kind of aid to the diffusional creep and dislocation creep. And in terms of uh, the stresses and temperature regime where they work, and it will become much more clear when we look at the deformation mechanism. But for now, if you look at diffusion creep, dislocation, or power law creep and dislocation glide creep, then we will see that diffusion creep occurs primarily when the stress is very low. Dislocation creep takes place intermediate stresses and dislocation glide governs at very high stresses. On the other hand, this one requires much higher temperature. This one is has less temperature dependence and this has even lesser temperature dependence. So in this lecture, we have understood the fundamentals of creep. We have gone through the different uh, types of, or the characteristics of creep. We have looked at the creep curve, the important characteristics of the curve. So we'll end this lecture at this and we'll come back and get to understand these, the, these uh, particular types of creep mechanisms in more detail in the next lecture. Thank you. Thank you.